Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. This week, we are going to be reviewing two new albums from two artists, one of which we have covered before. We're going to be talking about the brand new album from Australian rock band King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. We're going to be talking about their new album, uh, Omnium Gatherum. Those are definitely words that mean things. We're also going to be talking about the brand new album from Pusha T, the long-awaited follow-up to his very acclaimed record, Daytona. We're going to be talking about It's Almost Dry. Is that what the album is really called? Yeah, really- it's, it's a cocaine reference. I, um, I mean, like most things about this album, it is related to cocaine. A, I think it's fair to say, regardless of how you feel about the album, it's an awful album title and it's got a terrible album cover. <laughs> <laughs> it really does the fake album cover that was going around before the official art was released was so much better yeah also worth mentioning as well omnium gatherum uh, as i discovered this week while doing some research is also the name of a finnish melodic death metal band uh, i don't know i can only assume that's an intentional reference but i've never really i'm not familiar with the music of omnium gatherum but uh, they look pretty fucking sick in their band photos. It's not like a band I'd be into, honestly. We are back. Uh, we have a uh, special guest, Jacob, back with us yet again for another main episode to join us to talk about Pusha T and King Gizzard. And also, we want to shout out the fact that we have some hot videos, hot off the presses recently that you should check out. We just dropped our fourth video in our Bjork retrospective series on Vesper Teen. Jacob joined us for that as well. That was a really, really uh, great episode on a really really great and beloved album i will say i'm really excited for the next few episodes of the beer retrospective where we get to really get into the, like that that not talked about albums like uh mm-hmm. jeweler and volta and, and biophilia are going to be really interesting i yeah, think a lot of them are just as good as the talked about albums but uh you know you didn't okay. hear that from me there we go so yeah, yeah stick around Make sure that you uh, check those videos out if you have not already. Uh, we did an awesome record club on Porcupine Tree's Fear of a Blank Planet. It was a real proper nerdy jams and tea episode with me, Jake, and August. And we talked about uh, a classic modern prog record. And um, that was really fun too. And of course, last this time last week, we reviewed the new records from Billy Woods and Daniel Rossin as well. So more stuff coming your way too. Uh, we will tease as well that we have a discography review video coming on thursday and i'm not going to say who it's on except to say that it's a big artist who has an extremely high profile release dropping very soon so you can put the jigsaw pieces together there if you want the first person who's coming into your mind probably who we're talking about so yeah so stick around for that but before we get into any of our main reviews today let's talk about what we have been listening to for the last seven days jake what have you been listening to God, my week has been obscenely chaotic. I think I'm going to talk about the thing that is the least on brand for me. And like, I I need to preface this with, do not ask me why I did this. I don't have an answer. Um, I listened to two albums from an artist who interests me. Uh, and has for a while just because his his music is so adjacent to things that I really like. Um, and I, I guess the only note, like I can't even really un- like unpack why I did it now other than the fact that a family member of his has been in the news somewhat recently. That being, I listened to the two main projects from, uh, I guess he just goes by Jaden now, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's Jaden Smith. Um, oh boy! <laughs> I listened to uh, Sire, and I, I guess it's pronounced Iris. Um, his two his two like big major projects, other than his series of like Sunset Tapes things. And Jaden's always been like on my radar, just because I remember uh, back in like early college or late high school, I remember Zach talking about Sire when it came out because Sire, when it dropped, was actually an album that like a lot of people were talking about. And I feel like that's kind of faded to the periphery of the music consciousness just because, you know, nobody talks about it anymore. Um, But there was a decent amount of people who were listening to that when it came out. And I listened to it and I listened to Iris, which is like its sister album. It's like companion record. 
And he's always interested me just because like each of these albums starts with a suite that's like an anagram for like the color that is associated with the album. Like I think it's blue is iris and pink is sire, something like that. And it's like each of the letters is a song that the album starts out with. And I'm not gonna say that if you took these and made like an EP out of them that they would be like great or anything, there would be solid little experiments. Like there's some interesting stuff that like the first song on the uh, suite on Iris, it sounds like Evanescence. Like it's really weird. It's like a kind of melodramatic piano ballad thing. That's like, it's so funny because it's like, it, it's like, it's really cool. It's probably like the best song he's made, which is weird because it's also like not a complete song. It's kind of like an intro that's like really outlined, but it's like, it's like melodramatic and weepy and shit, but it's also just kind of like cool. And then it like really builds up at the very end. And then it immediately segues into the next song, which has the most generic trap beat you've ever heard in your life. So it's just like this huge piano, like guitar shit. And you're just like, oh, wow, what are we building to? And then it's just like trap hi-hat. <laughs> can I, can I, like, can oh, I ask why, why are these albums like 70 minutes long? And there we have arrived at the fucking problem is because there is an entire album's worth of content after these opening suites and it's inane. Jaden is a, like, clearly he is drawing from ideas that are interesting. Like, mainly he is drawing from Brock Hampton. He's drawing from Odd Future. He's drawing from Kid Cudi. He's drawing from, like, you know, Kanye, obviously. Um, lots of different shit, like alternative rock. He's got Willow on there a couple times. Um, and you can totally see that he's trying to be like a kid cutty. And the two biggest problems are the fact that like, he doesn't have an original bone in his body so that none of these songs, it's just like, oh, this is like, oh, like one of the vaguely punk rock inflected songs on Iris sounds like a horror track. So it's like, oh, okay. I mean, that it's just better done on what they've done, but whatever, man. But like, the weird thing is that like Jaden has this, you know, enormous Kanye sized ego to where he's constantly like comparing himself to like Martin Luther King and stuff. And the thing is, it's like, regardless of how you feel about Kanye, like he, he, he has the beats and the ego and the, the talent to kind of back it up, even if it doesn't always work for him. It's just like, one of my favorite Kanye West songs ever is Diamonds from Sierra Leone, which I feel like is sort of lost in the Kanye minutia these days as a song that like is heavily ego driven because it is literally Kanye connecting blood diamonds and his desire as a successful wealthy black man to buy and to represent his people with these diamonds. And it's like a really like it, once you like really get in the weeds about it, it's an interesting topic. And he actually like mines something cool out of it. Whereas Jaden's just like, I, I wonder if they understand the metaphors. That's a real line. That's a real line on Iris where he talks about people not being able to understand and like being innovative and doing all of these things. And he's constantly talking about he's, how he's iconic and how he's doing all these things. And it's just and he sounds so tired the whole time. He's just like. There's, there's one moment where he doesn't, there's one, and it's the final song in the Iris suite, which is funny because I keep mentioning these, is that Iris is definitely the worst album, uh, just because it's so scattershot and the production is so wonky and messy and frankly kind of awful occasionally. But the last song on the opening suite on that, he samples like clippers, like hair clippers, like, but, like a buzz like thing. And he like incorporates that into a beat and it's raw as fuck. He goes so hard on this one little track and he's got this beat in the background. It's like this, it's like, in, it's like something clipping would do. It's super cool. And then there's just like, it's just a wasteland on the rest of the album. And it's just, I've, I've never listened to these albums in full, but they've always interested me, I guess. So I just kind of did it to, to like check it off of a list, I suppose. But like, I don't know, man. <laughs> there is, I think, something interesting about like the idea of, you know, the 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 famous artists' children's vanity project, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess some people would find that whole concept insufferable, but I think there's like something, you know, uh, interesting and like like 
alluring about about that the idea of that and and the insight into that world that you get from it but i mean god you could you wouldn't catch me dead listening to either of these i'm so sorry i mean sire has a 10 minute song called lost boy and that tells me all i need to know about either not not a bad song honestly that's that's the funny thing is that Jaden when he wants to be ambitious, which is about 5% of the time, he gets, he doesn't like hit it out of the park or anything, but he does a good enough job. And then he's just so lazy on the rest of his shit. And I haven't even heard like all of his mixtapes and like the sunset tapes, which are supposedly just the the really lazy, really boring shit. Like I, I can't do that. Like, I'm sorry, but I will, I will suffer a little bit for people's entertainment and I will entertain the notion of listening to albums like Sire and Iris, but no further than that. I'm good, I, man. I want to uh, cap this segment off by reading a Rate Your Music review of Sire that is just one of the funniest things I've seen on this website. From Rate Your Music user Hear Snatcher, it makes me feel racist hearing Jaden saying the N-word. 98 cents stored childish Gambino act that is extremely embarrassing to sit through. Every song after Blue has no reason to be on the album, and there's 13 more tracks to enjoy. Quote, Batman, 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 please put me up on a Tesla. I'm trying to be hella extra. Please hand me down a new sweatshirt, unquote. Yep, but, seri- yep, that's, yep. <laughs> but, but seriously, why are we even listening to childish music like this when we could be discussing the political and economic state of the world? What's the point <laughs> of this hippie garbage? Go stop global warming instead of crying into a microphone. <laughs> I mean... It's it really does have like the the energy of like all of the cringy parts of early childish Gambino where like it has a remarkable similarity to I, I recently watched um Todd in the Shadows put out a video uh, a Train Records video about Will Smith's last album Lost and Found yeah uh, right. and like he's got this line on it where he's just like uh, you know something something will I be black enough and then it's just kind of like. I almost feel like Jaden is the inverse of that, where it's like Will feels so unconfident in his blackness on that particular song and on that particular record that he needs to kind of insist upon it. And Jaden, on the other hand, has so little street cred and so little like actual definitive heft behind his identity that whenever he like, you know, tries to be for lack of a better word gangsta it's just fucking hysterical (laughs) it's so funny um but look it's not devoid of interesting moments i will give it that much i wouldn't listen to two of these albums if it didn't if it all it did was bore the shit out of me which it only mostly did on the complete uh other side of things i've finally after kind of listening to them a little bit like a couple of years ago when uh, a new album of theirs came out and I sort of listened to a little bit of a canon record of theirs and was like damn this bangs and then just never got back into them is that I'm finally getting into the noise punk band lightning bolt and man man I went and listened to I started off with a weird choice because I knew I was going to listen to this band in depth. So I started off with the album of theirs that is the lowest rated, which is their only album that seems to be like lower rated than the other ones, which is Oblivion Hunter. And I really enjoyed Oblivion Hunter, actually. It's kind of like them doing a post-punky version of their own sound. Um, It's certainly a bit weirder and a little bit more inflected with like, it almost feels like mathy in places, but it doesn't quite have the same hard hitting appeal that the rest of their stuff has, but I still think it's a decent album that's worth checking out. But the album of theirs that I listened to that just absolutely knocked me on my ass this week is their most recent record, Sonic Citadel. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> it's oh my god this album is so fucking good dude like i i there is there are little things i enjoy more than a really great meat and potatoes noise rock album just because i love being able to just thrash the fuck out to something really bass really primal really fucking hard and there are very few things i have listened to that are harder than Sonic Citadel. The bass on this thing is like, I listened to this in my car on first listen. 
and could not have picked a better place to do it just because that bass, like literally like in that first track, it's like aiming to shake the earth beneath you. The way it uses it, it's like, it feels like the bass on it is trying to act the way that drums would in another like noise rock band. And it's just sensational. The way that these guys manage to eke out dynamism from this incredibly like limited palette is just insane. This is an album that is just a straight like hour of you getting your ass beaten. And I enjoyed every second of it. It was so good, man. Loved it. Loved it. Can't wait to check out shit like Wonderful Rainbow and Hyper Magic Mountain and just everything. Uh, yes. Love them. Hyper, Hyper uh, Magic Mountain is the fucking best headache you will ever have. <laughs> I'm so fucking ready, man. So ready. The cool thing about Lightning Bolt is that like all of their core records like are, are basically sound exactly the same, like more or less. Like they don't really switch their sound up at all again i haven't heard of oblivion hunter so that might be an interesting discursion but like somehow they have this incredibly primitive simple thing and they very seldom tweak it in any way and yet somehow it never gets exhausting or overdone or overplayed somehow i never get tired of hearing the same formula done because they just are so good at it consistently like sonic citadel really doesn't sound all that different from hyper magic mountain and they both kick my ass the biggest difference is that with fantasy empire and sonic citadel that's when they kind of started recording with hi-fi technology so the records sound a bit more like uh you know more conventionally produced Modern. as as far as a uh lightning bolt record even can but i um and while i probably do think that sonic citadel is my favorite one of theirs I also really love the primitive sound of their 2000s records. Like uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I think the band that are most similar to them are like drums, not dead era liars, where you just have this yeah. kind of like, like tribal uh, insanity. Um, but yeah, the way that the, the bass is kind of like tuned and, and affected and stuff to sound like, it sounds like it's fucking like just beating into your brain tissue. It, it's insane. Uh, I would say, um, the one I would, the record I would say to definitely not miss, probably my second favorite one is Earthly Delights from 2009. That album is just yep. absolutely fantastic from, from front to back. And it has my favorite Lightning Bolt song on it. But honestly, like their records are so like Wonderful Rainbow, Hyper Magic Mountain, Earthly Delights, Fantasy Empire and Sonic Citadel. Like, they're like so equal to each other in quality that it's and without really being all that distinct, that it's kind of a miracle that the band are, you know, as good and as enduring as they are and not just kind of this one trick pony band that kind of get tiring. If you, you've got to, I guess, be in a certain mood to listen to them and they will give you like I, I, the best headache you've ever had as, um, as Jacob said, that's a beautiful way of describing this band. But, you know, it's just like, it's, it's a hit of like primal testosterone, frankly. And when you're in the mood for that, then nothing, nothing compares to, to Lightning Bolt. It's really just because they have a mastery of the fundamentals of song construction because yeah, it is that kind of same formula and even like across like the same record or different records, it's really that just, they are masters of knowing how to construct a song, how to like put it into the studio and make it feel different than everything around it. The, the, the fact that they've been able to do this for like nigh 20 years at this point is just like, I, I sincerely look forward to whatever they do next. Uh, and I can't wait to listen to the rest of their shit just because I love when a band yeah. is able to sort of master their own formula this just concisely. I think also their best songs like uh, Dead Cowboy and Transmissioner and, and all of the longest tracks that they've done, like one mm -hmm. of the appeals of them is that like, even though it's incredibly loud and incredibly noisy and like headache inducing, it also has a kind of drone quality to it where you kind mm -hmm. of just totally. find it it's a hypnotic experience i don't know if that's maybe as true of, of their more recent stuff but like i think about their their classic records and and they're punishing but like in the same way that maybe if a swans record is punishing but like I, with with yes, the bpm early like, swans. with the bpm like just ratcheted way up and they have the same effect of just being like really kind of hypnotic listening experiences it's like death from above, like early death from above and like pre-children of God swans. That's what it's like. Yeah. And that's just my shit, frankly. 
And another uh, first listen I gave to a band that I've been meaning to get into for a long time, just because I'm surrounded by people who love them. And I, there's no reason to think why I, I wouldn't be heavily into them as I listen to Music to Play in the Dark by Coil. First Coil album that I've ever heard. Um, and it will certainly not be the last because this was just outstanding. And it was also like, I knew that they were sort of adjacent to shit like current 93 for a couple of reasons, but like this album specifically reminded me a lot of their more like ambient uh, focused projects, which was like a perfect in for me, just because that's the shit that I really gravitate towards with them. And I just, I mean, I, I guess I, the one thing I didn't expect from it is that it's, it's really just like fundamentally is that music to play in the dark is kind of an IDM record. And I didn't really expect how kind of aggressive and sort of kind of rhythmically oriented that it ended up being. Uh, and then there are moments where it kind of peels back and that sort of like sizzling electronic texture that this album plays with that I just fucking love so much will sort of like peel back for like a more atmospheric moment, um, notably on a song like Broccoli, which probably my least favorite song on there but i will be damned if i can't li if i wouldn't listen to a 20 minute long song of him repeating that passage of eat your green <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's man. like so fucking unnerving but i really like it i don't even uh, um jake i need um, you to like promise me you'll listen to music to play in the dark too this week because mm -hmm. like it's like listening to Bath without listening to Leaving Your Body Map. Like there's there are two like okay. linked records, and I actually think that the second one is even better than the first one. But it's a bit of a hot take. But um, yeah, I just like it's something weird about Coil in this particular era where it's like kind of soothing, as soothing as yeah. it is like very eerie as well. Like it's just it's really strange. Like you, you, it's the kind of music you could put on to like vibe out to at night, but it also like it's probably going to induce sleep paralysis. So, so just be Nightmare careful. Of some kind. Be careful. Yeah, I mean, it's like fucking like someone needs to make a meme where it's just like listening to Coil is just like scary autecker. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> It's good. I, I I will listen to music to play in the dark. And, you know, I also want to listen to shit like the Ape of Naples and Time Machines, Black Antlers, you know, all yeah. of their like really big shit. And I guess the last thing that I will mention here for this week is a re-listen to an album that I haven't talked about on here just because it's overshadowed by the project that this particular artist dropped beforehand as being like a really big staple of uh, 2010s sort of canonical records and then sort of followed it up weirdly and also I think just to get out of his record deal. But I gave a re-listen to Frank Ocean's Endless, um, oh. which... Blonde is one of my favorite albums of all time. And honestly, I've probably listened to Endless like a little bit more just because it's, you know, it's like a 36 minute long album. And I've always just, that was one of the first albums of its kind that I ever listened to. Like I didn't ever listen to anything that was that avant-garde and weird before. So it always kind of had a special place in my heart, but something about this listen this time just really hit and maybe it's just because I haven't heard it in a while it was sort of an album that for a while like I would listen to it at the end of shifts just to sort of speed through those last 30 minutes just because it was a good you know piece of uh music to just sort of like burn through kind of quickly but there's something about that album that just really gets better and gets under my skin the more I listen to it and it's also just something that's kind of impossible to talk about just because it is such a formless experiment in Frank Ocean's really weirder fringe tendencies as an artist. I mean, there are parts of that that are just pure like electronic fuckery. And then there, you know, there's the fucking cover on that. Like, I think the opener on that um, is yeah. one of Frank Ocean's best fucking songs ever one Gorgeous. of the most beautiful things he's ever made and it also has my favorite frank ocean song which is higgs which is just like this really forlorn just absolutely like like almost like elliot smith style like uh acoustic guitar thing and it has like his best vocal performance in my opinion just an absolute like it's not an album that i think even 
strictly like works in the way that a traditional album might but god damn does it remain a ruthlessly compelling experience that in between its moments of pure almost frivolous experimentation hide some of the most essential moments of one of the 2010s most interesting breakout artists uh stuff that like really i kind of overlooked before stuff like uh, tracks like Florida or Comme des Garçons are just like, they're brief, but man, I remember every fucking second of what those songs sound like at this point. So that's an album that I can easily see someone just being like, eh, I mean, it's fine. It's weird. It's gay. Get rid of it. Uh, but I also just, I just love at this point. Please, new new album, sir. Sometime. I will say, Endless is a bit of a mixed bag for me, but the last four songs on this record is simply my favorite like consecutive stretch of music on any frank ocean record and i remember like because i had like the the original rip of the live stream for like forever Mm -hmm. like even after the reissue came out in 2018 and so i never really fully experienced mitsubishi sony as the closer because the live stream ended differently and um then when I like finally listened to this in full and that last stretch of music hit like Mitsubishi Sony is just some of like the fucking coolest sounding shit. Uh, and it comes right after Higgs, which is like <laughs> just fucking devastating, man. It's just so, so fucking good. Like, oh, oh, fuck. It's good. Okay. Love that shit. Like my favorite Frank Ocean songs are probably always going to be Ivy and Solo, just because those two songs I think oh, are perfect. So I, I, I love how like minimal they are, but the the run at the end of Endless, like God damn. Like the beginning of Blonde and the end of Endless is just like, oh, Jesus fuck, dude. <laughs> Pink and white, fucking greatest shit ever. Right. Well, what have I been listening to this week? I checked out actually several Connor core records because Connor is like uh, one of our friend Connor who's on the podcast fairly often is probably the person who I share like the most commonality with in terms of taste along with Jake. And so I always want to listen to a record when Connor loves it because it's always some shit that I'm like, I had no good reason for not having heard this already. And so uh, one, one record I checked out that Connor absolutely loves is a record from a band called The Go Team. And it's called Thunder Lightning Strike. And this is one of the most unique records that I've heard uh, in a while. I I don't know what I was expecting. I think I was expecting like this to be a kind of like uh, indie rock sort of emo tweed Los Campesinos type thing, just because of the band name having an exclamation mark in it, I guess. And it kind of looks a bit twee, but that's not what this is at all. This is like a Plunderphonics indie tronica dance record. It has like... It's, it's half like, you know, avalanches and half like fucking one o tricks point never. It's like all over the shop. And it is it so is. unique. It is really fucking cool. Like actually the avalanches are a really good reference point actually because there are songs on here that sound a lot like avalanches. And like, if you like plunder phonics, if you like like sample heavy uh, music that has a, like a, a good beat to it. And you just like hearing records that are totally unique and don't really sound like very much else at all then i can't recommend this enough it's 35 minutes it's an absolute breeze to listen to and it's an absolutely fun super cool vibe i'm at the point now where uh, i'm automatically going to give more points to a record for just being unique in an interesting and enjoyable way and this record is that but it's also just a really fun time on top of that so i can't recommend that enough i also want to recommend uh another Uh, album that i listened to this week for the first time that fits the genre of like this is super unique we've talked a little bit about uh dance punk on this podcast i don't think we reviewed much of it we kind of alluded to it and um some of my favorite like dance punk bands of the like late 2000s uh early 2010s are the bands that kind of fuse that style with math rock and i discovered a really interesting band uh called late of the pier uh, they're a, a British band. I think they're a British band. Um, they only put out one album in 2008 called Fantasy Black Channel. And this is like one of the best albums I've heard all year. Like this is the, one of the most unique albums I've heard all year. It's part like Man Alive era, everything, everything, like early falls, Death from Above oh. 1979, 
like um, it has this incredible fusion of sounds and influences and just really awesome aesthetics and vibes. I, I can't, I, I'm getting a bit like excessive in my praise for some of these records, but man, if you want to hear some shit that sounds like an amalgamation of, of these really disparate influences, but also still sounding like completely like its own thing altogether, then I can't recommend this enough. It's like Los Campesinos, Death from Above 1979, and Of Montreal in a blender. Like it has, it's as much oh. hissing fauna, are you the destroyer, as it is like, you're a woman, I'm a machine. It's all over the place. It's fun. It's dancey. It's really addictive. And it seems to be like a bit of a cult classic that is really super slept on. So it gets the highest endorsement from me. I got around to a very Jake Core album this week, which I was thrilled to get around to, which is the uh, Alice Coltrane and Carlos Santana record, Illuminations. I finally listened to this. This My shit baby. is gorgeous. Like I was expecting like a beautiful, like Alice Coltrane, you know, doing her heart thing and Carl Santana just laying down sick licks. And it is that, but it's also like, it has this kind of like cinematic, like, uh, you know, modern film score-esque feel to it, where it's like super uh, stringsy and kind of just ornate and lush. And it wasn't really what I was expecting. I had to listen to it a couple of times. Uh, I started playing a new video game this week. Well, not a new game. It's a very old classic game called Braid, which I've been wanting to play for ages. And I'm listening to, uh, you know, instrumental records. I'm, I'm queuing shit up to listen to while I play it. And this was a, a lovely soundtrack for that. I listened to it twice in a row. And I just really enjoyed it. Um, not like, I don't think I have the same level of effervescent adoration as, as Jake does and as Saoirse does and, and Zach. Uh, but I do really appreciate this record. I'm glad I got around to it. Uh, it was very, very pretty, and it, it sounds sounded good. Uh, the spiritual jazz album. It, it's gorgeous. The... I mean, that's that's Karma by Fero Sanders, but I, I will give this record some points for sure. It's not exactly like they're that far away in terms of quality, in my opinion. But this is just the. It's certainly mm. like an underrated record we can all agree on that uh it deserves more love immensely like like the fact that alice coltrane and carlos santana made an album together and seemingly nobody fucking talks about it yeah what i need to listen to this shit afterwards i've all i've only heard journey in um Sachet and Nando. it's one of the greatest fucking things i've ever heard in my life and i've always wanted to explore more of her discog yeah, I want yeah, I want to listen to this essential. especially because we talked about when we did our guitar solos video. I talked about a solo on the collaborative record that Carlos Santana did with John McLaughlin, and that's a great mm -hmm. and very underrated record too. And yeah, just general like Carlos Santana collaborating with you know fusion jazz or like spiritual jazz figures in general is is that's the source. It's it's a bit of an underrated thing step in Alice's career too because if you like look at the trajectory of her albums she's kind of an artist who like has like two or three albums that are like really canonized but has a lot of albums afterwards that are just fantastic and Illuminations is like the point at which she goes and transitions fully into spiritual jazz and like that's the part of her career that i am the most enamored with like just from i just from like a raw sound standpoint so it, it's a like it's an entire world of music that most people just have not explored yet and on the note of like fucking gorgeous sort of psychedelic wonderful records one of the most like exciting things for music nerds that happened this week was that uh, rate your music introduced a new site update and one of the new features oh, yeah. that they unveiled is this thing called recommendations where they take into account like all of your, the albums and artists and genres and descriptors that you enjoy. And they churn out recommendations based on records that are popular on the site that fit in with those things. And one of the most highly rated records is actually an album that when we had uh, Mika on the podcast to talk about Big Thief, uh, he recommended this album to us, which is uh, the album from Ninos Del Ciro called Lance. Uh, this is a right. very, this is a very beloved neo psychedelic rock record, and I've been wanting to check it out for ages. And I just, it was like number two on my recommendations list. So, okay, this is all the excuse I need. I'm going to put this on, and <laughs> it's a fucking great album. Like, holy shit, I'm getting Riley. I I have not looked at the recommendations tab 
this entire time. I just clicked it. This album is number two yeah. on my list. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what uh, it is. I mean, it's just, it seems to be getting, uh, it seems to be this really like rate your music core record, but I don't want that to take away from the potential appeal that this might have for people because it's just a great fucking album. Like it's just, it's gorgeous. It's equal parts like Animal Collective and like, king gizzard like not really but like kind of it has a psychedelic rock edge that feels akin to some of their music but it's very beautiful reminded me actually a little bit of like the madu mokta record from last year to a certain extent as well uh, it has these sort of longer song structures that really kind of unfurl and it's beautiful sounding in general and i just had a great time with it it's full of surprises too in a way that kept it really fresh for me um so yeah i can't recommend that enough apparently the follow-up to this record is coming out this year too. So that's quite exciting. Oh. I look forward to uh, when more info gets announced about that. Um, but yeah, Lance by Nino Del Ciro gets a definitely a, a strong tick from me. This was actually a really strong week for me giving records uh, 8 out of 10s unexpectedly with Go Team and Later the Pier as well. So um, yeah, high, high recommendation from me. I've, I've been effusive in my praise for a lot of records uh, that I listened to this week. And oh. so I think it's only fair to balance that with uh, one of the worst albums of the year <laughs> that, oh. I, that I discovered oh, this no. week. And I have no context for this artist. I'd never heard of this artist before. It just seemed to be trending on rate new music. And a lot of people were listening to it. And a lot of people were rating it very highly. And this is an artist... Um, it's an artist that's definitely not for me. I, I think that there, I kind of see why people, especially young people like this artist, but I have to be entirely honest and say, I found this absolutely unbearable. And to a certain extent, it was like me trying to grapple with the distance between this is not for me and like, no, but this is objectively shit music like i i was trying to ah yes the whole lot of red dilemma i, I was trying to kind of reconcile those things and it's really funny because it's already bolded and it's been out for a week which is just so funny to me and it's very much so the artist is called wyland and the album is called vices and it is a oh. a synth pop record from a trap artist and already your alarm bells should be ringing mm. This is very much what I would term drain gang core music. Uh, if you're into artists like Blade and Echo 2K, you'll probably be into Wyland. And what's doubly troubling about this. Not a Mike Dean feature. Yeah, Mike what? Dean has um, production all over this, apparently. What's um, doubly troubling about this for me is that I recently dipped my toes into the drain gang world and actually quite enjoyed what I found, like the new uh, collaborative record from Blade and Eco 2K, Crest, I think is one of the best records of the year. I, I gave that an eight out of 10, which is like, you know, which felt like a big deal for me. I, I thoroughly thought that was above and beyond. Really, really good. Although I definitely won't be for everyone. Um, so I was like, okay, I kind of think I'm starting to get the scene a little bit anyway. And this, I just listened to this and it's just, it's, dog shit dude like it's it's fucking <laughs> terrible like not even just like the fact that it's the blandest synth pop ever like it's like fucking just so i mean fucking kid cuddy could make a better synth pop record than this like musically oh. but it's not even that it's the fact that lyrically this is the most like anodyne and just like casually misogynistic <laughs> music that i've ever heard it is incel core synth pop it's uh, like uh. it's like there's a <laughs> I, I don't get mad at it because it's too like you know harmless to be mad at but it's also like it is misogynistic like there is a song on this called can't save her and <laughs> And, uh, I'm, I've got some alarms ringing in my head. And it's basically like about, you know, how <laughs> bitches, man, am I right? It's like, you know, it's, it's the worst tendencies of like 
you know, early the weekend with none of the like, you know, flair and personality. It's just all these like, I can't save her. I can't save her. Her promiscuous behavior. I just can't oh my save her. Fucking God. You have nowhere to run. You just don't know what to say. It's on the tip of your tongue. Now your heart's in your lung. You better have all your fun because she wants everybody. She always says you're her first, but she's got plenty of mileage. Like, it's just like the most cringy sort of shit. Uh, it, it sounds it, like Volcanic Bird Enemies tethered album. It's, <laughs> oh, I mean, I hate that you make that comparison, but it also kind of is the inverse of that. Like, it's it's just like, it's so self-loathing in a way that is just not at all endearing to me. Lyrics like, oh, I feel like I'm trapped in my mind. There's no real purpose to life. The clock is ticking in time. Song titles like Broken Ego. In time, as opposed to slipping into the void uh, and, and, and still chasing after happiness. <laughs> Better place. Blaming myself. Wanted more. Like all of these songs. These lyrics or song titles? Because I can't tell. Th- these are both. Can't love until you love yourself. Too scared to look in the mirror. Oh. The Get empty shell that. that stares at me back. My confidence starts to crack. Love falls apart. It all falls apart. I'm blinded by my broken ego. Like, uh, danger. <laughs> I swear, I wish it was a, an Ariana Grande cover, but it's not. There is a song on here called Dangerous Woman. She said she want to dance, but I don't dance. She said she need a man, but she don't need a man. She'll put you in a trance at first glance. Don't want to fall in love, but I'll take a chance. Yeah, she's a dangerous woman. She's the devil in designer clothes. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Um, Man, that she, shit was old when Kanye did it in 2010. Uh, Come on, man. She's just too hard to love, and you'll hurt for the rest of your life because she'll love you with her lies. Been the hardest to love. It, they're all so like boilerplate. Like Kid Cudi writes this kind of shit, but at least he's like so bad at singing that you kind of like can get a kick out of it. Like, um, and like his writing is like it's not always good but it's like personable like you get it like it's from a person who is not who has original thoughts in their head and hasn't just discovered self-loathing tm yeah you ever heard of radiohead yeah it's just it's terrible and like i only really emphasize all of this terribleness because it seems to be received, being received so well. You uh, and Connor are the only people I follow on Rate Your Music who've reviewed it, and you both hit it with like a three. Well, he only, listened, he only listened to it because I was listening to it and seen how terrible it was. Like, it's, I know that, uh, hey, look. That should validate your opinion because he is a little bit more into Drain Gang stuff than you are, though. Exactly. And it's just, it's, it's awful. And um, yeah, it's bad. It's bad, it's bad, bad, bad bad music it's it's bad and that's all i have to say jacob what have you been listening to recently that you want to shout out i want to shout out at first an album that you had recommended last week um i have listened to it around the same time as fucking hatchy giving the world away i had a really terrible week a uh, really stressful week and this shit just fucking hit like i've listened to this at least once a day for the past few days take my hand i think i've looped like at least 10 times in a row it's the fucking greatest mazzy star song that mazzy star had never wrote it is just perfect dream pop bliss it's everything everything that i've been that I've been getting into lately. It's my album of the year alongside Soul Glow and Fox Hills. Those are like tied at number one for me. Like I, I thought that this was immaculate and had some of the warmest music that I had heard so far this year. Absolutely adore this. I, I will say that um, I'm not totally head over heels for this record, but I do really, really like it. And I think it's highlights in particular, Take My Hand being one of them, but particularly the rhythm Uh, And I want to shout out my favorite song on here, which is like top three singles of the year, which is This Enchanted. Uh, That song song is amazing. Like it's a, okay, so it's a shoegazy pop song, cool. But like 
I love how intense the guitars get like as the song goes on like the last part of the song is pr- almost like noisy shoegaze which is like this is a proper like dream pop like you know polished artist so when you hear that level of like intensity it's just really like blows you away and also there's some Madchester baggy influence on this like some primal scream type shit happy mondays primal scream type psychedelic pop shoegaze influence on this too that just gives it a really unique feeling so i i appreciate this record for that and this enchanted man has been like on on repeat a lot this week it's it's a fucking incredible song and uh i want to shout out uh los campesinos for hold on now youngster what a fucking discovery this was (laughs) i was uh, i okay like i think it i I remember in the group chat, I asked a bunch of you, like, what what should I listen to, like, right now? Because I had to go for a walk. And then you were like, oh, hold on now, youngster. And I was like, all right, let's 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 listen to this. First listen, I'm like, okay, I see what Riley really likes about this. I'm, I'm enjoying it myself. Second, third listen, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm head over heels on this record. This shit was fucking incredible. Oh, um, this is it uh, i was i've been waiting for the opportunity to get you to listen to the jacob because not only is it my second favorite record of all time it is like to me it felt like the kind of record you would really like connect to yeah. because it has like this brightness and, and just fun energy that i think i thought would be really your thing and it also was, just great melodies yeah. great hilarious lyrics and just incredible sense of emotion to this album is like this album is everything i could want in a record yeah, I fucking death to Los Campus. Just from the opening track, like I was immediately on board with this. Banger. And the fucking drumming and these bright, amazing guitar melodies and the fucking harmonies between the two lead singers. I was like, holy shit, where the hell has this album been? I don't think I've, I hadn't heard of this band, I think, until you brought them up or maybe I heard of them in passing or something like that. But um, Matt Tog esque yeah. drumming. Like yes. yeah, um, oh, and shit. look, ignore the rate your music ratings. Every album this band has put out is fucking True. great. This is yeah. like I think th- this is my favorite band, like in general. And I I just like I can't I like I I want to shout at everyone I meet to listen to them. So yes. I'm so psyched. I think you'll really love their other music too. And I just I love that we have a new person in the fold on this band because I just I, I, I cannot I cannot shout their name from the rooftops enough. Like yeah. God this I am planning to like do a deep dive on their <sighs> whole disc, which isn't like very long. No, I think it's like six five albums and they're all just rippers, 40 minute oh. rippers. Okay. My my year in lists, like fucking I I'm obsessed with like the idea of lists in general. So that shit fucking hit home for me. This is a, this is like, a, one of the best company. records I've, I've heard without a doubt. I, I love this. And uh, in terms of big discographies, I also want to shout out Clipping. I listened to their entire discography and uh, being the fucking former question mark theater kid I am, I knew Dovey Diggs from his musicals before I knew him as Clipping. I knew Clipping existed. I just, or like not as Clipping. Like I didn't, I, I didn't really know Clipping before. Like I was introduced to them on like a best songs of 2016 playlist. And I had never gotten the chance to dive into their discography in full. And I, I, I had heard a couple of their albums before this, of course, this band is fucking great. The fucking combination of industrial and David's just like extremely poetic lyrics. This man is, this man is the Rod Serling of hip hop. He just knows how to take a story and just describe all of its darkest elements and yet also have a sick, twisted, sadistic smile at the end of it all. Just like, hmm, isn't that just kind of fucked up? Uh, I, I absolutely adore this band. Visions of Bodies Being Burned is that's my the, favorite album yeah. by them. I think that's it's their best record too. Perfect, perfect, close to perfect album. Uh, but I want to shout out one track in particular, which uh, the people I was listening to with this too, like they absolutely fucking hated it. 
it was the last track on Mid City, the outro. Get money, get I money, get money, fun. get money, get money, get money. Get Dude, money. love that song. <laughs> it's, they, I think they were all just like, no, no minimalism, no repeats. This shit is not for me. And then I don't know. I kind of thought it was brilliant. And uh, like learning that was a tribute to Steve Reich made it okay. They yeah, that makes. Oh wow! Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I think Mid City in general is a fairly underrated release. Like, uh, uh, Kim, absolutely. I think that Killer is one of their best songs. Uh, I, I oh, I, I agree. I get that track stuck in my head very easily. It's also got Raphael Casal on it from who you'll know as the his co-star in Blind Spotting, as well. So that's a cool bit of um of how they go way back. But yeah, that was I remember. Like, I got into clipping when initially around the time that mixtape first came out and so that was like they were so mysterious then and no one knew who david dix was so it's kind of cool yeah. seeing how they've how far they've come now i will say this what's cool like what's cool about david dix is that like he is also you know this now this high profile actor he does you know like he stars in hamilton he's in like you know doing doordash commercials and yet <laughs> Like still like a completely different person on the mic and whatnot. Like he, they managed to have that perfect balance between you know being in this experimental hip hop group and you know being this you know movie star and actor who does Disney on films on Sesame and Street. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I always, uh, yeah. God. Yeah, Clipping is one of my favorite bands of the 2010s. I yes to all of what. Did you listen to Wriggle by chance? Yes, uh, and it has Fucking. my second favorite clipping song, which is Shooter. Yeah, of shoot. course, it's my second Fuck favorite clipping you. song because it's all it's it's all fucking puns it, yeah it has my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite little like uh lyrical moments on any clipping song which is shooter went nuts cashew <laughs> <laughs> yeah w Dix is like my favorite mc of of all time that like he's never spit a bar that is anything short of hard Jacob, did you know that um, the Eurogastrodon the Blood and Visions of Bodies Being Buried were originally going to be like one double album? Mm. And that, then... that would be, I mean, I actually am kind of glad they split them up because it just, they have their own like uh, satisfying sort of structure to them. But like imagining them together as like a gigantic like two hour record is like, that's that's a mega brain shit right there. That's, that's what I have it on as on my list of favorite albums of all time. I have it as a double album just because I can't not think of it that way anymore. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I see it. And it's interesting because like there existed an addiction to blood ends with, you know, piano burning, which feels like the death, the literal death of music. I mean, that's a compliment, of course. And then you have like it, mm -hmm. and then you have visions of bodies being burned which ends with secret peace, which ends like, you know, extremely hopefully and like the sun rising after the darkest shit you've ever seen in your life. And last thing I will mention is a re-listen. Uh, I, uh, it's basically already considered to be a modern classic, but listening to this again really kind of reminded me why it was. Amy Winehouse, Back to Black. It, and especially oh, like yeah. the difference between Frank and then the, the pure just evolution and like creative control that was given to her on that last album it really like it is like you know a tight composite of like an absolutely tight track list it is just like some of the most heartbreaking vocals you will ever hear in your goddamn life knowing the story of amy winehouse and some of these tracks makes them even much sadder but it really is if it's not a perfect record it's close to perfect in my opinion on that note, let's get into our first record of the day, which is, of course. The new album from Pusha T, It's Almost Dry. Now, uh, yes. Pusha T, an artist who needs very little introduction. Terrence LeVar Thornton. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, formerly of the classic duo clips now very much his own uh solo artist with a very established career and a very established name for himself i uh, had a very uh busy decade what's interesting about pusha t is like he's i think more interesting as like a figure and as a wordsmith than as like an album's artist i think like he mm. is the kind of artist who pops up who's popped up all across 
the 2010s doing really interesting and really cool things and iconic features ever since he kind of first hooked up with Kanye and he was all over my beautiful dark twisted fantasy obviously of course the clips stuff too but I'm talking about him as a solo artist he's had a, a kind of up and down and strange career but he's never really been anything less than magnetic uh, but he has kind of settled into a groove I think that was really ignited with his last record 2018's Daytona which was his I think most people agree his first like properly great solo record and like a really concise set of tracks that saw him collaborating with Kanye to make some of the most electric and fiery music of that era. I think the general consensus is that of the, you know, the, 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 the summer of 2018 Kanye West records that he produced, like that was generally agreed to be uh, the best one. It's certainly, I think my, uh, the one I enjoy the most. Um, but regardless of whether or not you think it's the best one, it certainly is like a moment. It represents a moment for Pusha T and even for Kanye to a certain extent as well, because it reignited and, and sort of lit a new flame under Pusha T in terms of like, you know, critical appeal and general esteem as a solo artist. And also like it reignited, you know, Kanye's perception as well, because it was some of his most electric production, you know, on anything right. in, a, in a good while leading up to that. Daytona was like a fuller sound than we'd heard from Kanye in a while, I think. And so that was really exciting and Pusha was great. And um, one of the things that I think Pusha has really been, uh, has really gotten his due for more recently is actually how great of a writer he is, like a rap writer that he is. And one of the things that I think It's Almost Dry functions as, it's kind of like a victory lap for Pusha as a writer, like, The bars on this record are frequently hilarious. They're frequently very funny. They're frequently very tongue-in-cheek. There's very little stakes in a record like this. It feels very much like, like I say, a victory lap sort of album. Reminds me a little bit of um, that Denzel Curry record from a few weeks ago where there were very little stakes involved there for Denzel. He was kind of just coasting on a kind of, era that he's existing in at the moment where everyone kind of loves him and he can kind of just you know effortlessly just put out music and and just you know people will lap it up because it's just great to be basking in the presence of this artist and I have mixed feelings on this record I think that it it highlights a lot of weaknesses I think in Pusha as an album's artist but one thing I do want to say up the bat just really unequivocally that across this record he his pen game is is in, but virtually immaculate there are some moments i think that are stronger than others but in general uh if you enjoy Pusha t the writer then you'll get a lot uh out of this i think that there are a lot of really like memorable beats as well even if i have some severe issues with certain aspects of how they come across but um Overall, this is a record that Pusha T fans, I think, will get a lot of mileage out of. It seems to be well received by them. Jacob, as our guest, I'd love to hear from you first uh, what you think of this and what you what your kind of uh, feelings on Pusha are or were leading up to this and how you feel like it it it, it lands for you. I do enjoy Pusha T. I'm not like a super fan of his music. I still need to listen to more clips. I had heard Daytona for the first time a while ago and. I thought it was awesome. Uh, very all killer, no filler sort of record, which that's what I admire about Pusha T as a whole. Like I, I was listening to an interview with him not too long ago where uh, somebody, I think the radio host had asked him like, like uh, do you don't really drop any of these like big 20, 25 songs projects. And he was like, no, like he said to the, something to the extent of like, I can't make a masterpiece in 20 to 25 songs. Like if, like, I feel like to him, everything has to be like to him just no filler no bullshit like especially because that's his background is battle rap and coke rap which is basically just like you deliver your bars and then you just and then you're done i miss and that's something to very much admire about his uh, about his rap style about his albums and this album especially i definitely i think there is a lot to like on here i think because Daytona to me felt like in some ways the victory lap it opens on very much a victory lap if you with if you know you know which to me is one of the best hip-hop songs or even songs of the 2010s which is you know he compares himself to Pink Floyd he you know talks about 
you know, his car and everything that makes him just one of the best in the game today. Whereas this record starts out with Brambleton, which is honestly a much sadder track. It opens up with him talking about how, you know, his associate to clips Pooh had gotten shot uh, because of gang related issues. And so there, I think there is something, you know, much more personal on this record, something much darker that I thought uh, was interesting throughout the whole project, especially by the last track, which is basically Eclipse Reunion. I think there mm-hmm. is a lot to like here. I think some of the beats on repeated listens just felt very kind of one note, like uh, like which is always kind of disappointing because I know that Pharrell and Kanye can sometimes give you these incredible, incredible beats Mm. but in terms of like a pen game and a flow and you know i thought some of the guest features on here were excellent i was left satisfied overall with this record especially with the last three tracks which i think are some of the best that i've heard from pusha yeah it was worth mentioning as well like as you've alluded to the production on this record is is divided like basically evenly between Kanye and Pharrell. You have six tracks produced by Kanye, you have six tracks produced by Pharrell, primarily at least. There are other kind of collaborations and stuff, but you have, and and a lot of people are, I I guess, making this a kind of part of the narrative of this record. I think even you have like the label themselves kind of endorsing these alternate track listing versions of this album where it's like Ye versus Pharrell uh, and and Pharrell versus Ye, where you have all the Pharrell songs in the first half, all the Ye songs in, on the back half, or vice versa. And like, to me, that's just, I, it, it, it's a weird thing. It feels very much like a hip hop Twitter thing where people kind of fixate on, oh, this is team Kanye, team Pharrell, where it's just like, they're both doing their own thing here to more or less positive results. I, I think generally the beats on this are pretty good like they're at least quite memorable my biggest Mm -hmm. reservation about this record uh is the mastering uh mixing and mastering but i think it more relates to how these songs are mastered uh this is a record that is made to be heard in the car to be heard on speakers that have a high bass system to be heard frankly on flimsy hardware i think like listening to this on luxurious headphones is almost a painful experience because of not only how brick walled everything is, which is not unusual. Like a lot of modern rap records have this certain level of compression and brick walling to kind of add this intensity to it. And I almost feel like there's an obvious brick wall, cocaine brick pun I could have made there, but I'm going to resist. Uh. <laughs> um, and it's kind of infuriating because like I said, I do think there are uh, some really strong beats on here. Brambleton, Dreaming of the Past, I think is one of is a really great uh, beat that Kanye lays down. There's a cool story about how Pusha essentially had to beat Kanye for like years to be allowed to use it and then had to lead him on the track uh, in order to yeah. kind of convince him. Uh, there's other like memorable beats here as well. I think Diet Coke's a pretty strong song with a pretty memorable beat. Um, yeah, there's songs that have good beats that I don't otherwise enjoy very much at all, like rock and roll and um, hear me clearly, I guess. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the problem is, is that whether or not I'm enjoying the beats in any given moment, the, they are mastered so ear scrapingly loudly that it just becomes a thoroughly unpleasant experience. And there are moments where it's so, it's in such poor taste that it completely undermines incredibly positive aspects i otherwise have of the songs and i hate having to bench my critiques on this because it means that i feel like i have to overlook things that are genuinely great and maybe more substantive like i think a, the perfect case in point for this is the song dreaming of the past which is one of the best songs on the record in terms of like the creativity and color of the beat in terms of the rapping especially of pusha but also kanye is pretty good on it too and yes Kanye makes this beat so loud and he mixes the the vocals in such a strange way such that the beat itself completely overpowers Pusha. Like it's so much louder than Pusha that it almost feels like, you know, it's insulting. Like you're actually actively having to like tune out the beat to try and like pick up on what Pusha is saying. And the fucking funniest thing about it, right, 
is you get to the last part of the song when Kanye comes in, and then Kanye is mixed louder than the beat. And it's like, what are you doing? You fucking... <laughs> you're just... It's so blatant. Like, it's like... It, it completely cuts out. Like, I don't want to... I don't want to hear Kanye louder than the beat and Pusha quieter than the beat, especially when Pusha is giving such energy. And to me, this is like emblematic of so many of the confusing and bizarre decisions that are made by both Kanye and Pharrell in terms of the way that they they chop these beats up and then in terms of the way that the music is mastered in the final part of the process as well. You have songs that are you know, they, they are mastered, you know, okay, but then just have these really anodyne and just kind of infuriatingly dull beats. Like, I cannot stand the beat on Let the Smokers Shine the Coops. It's so, like, uh, on a tone yeah, and just kind of, like, repetitive and grating, which, again, it's other than that, there's some cool bars here. It's a good song. I think... Uh, it's cool for, like, for like a good solid 10 seconds of Push's flow is, like, really cool with this beat. And then it just, it just keeps going. And, and like so a, another good. example as well is um, one of the most minimal songs in this record, Just So You Remember, which again, I think has some of the best bars on the record. Like it's, it's a really kind of funny song. It has this uh, chopped up sample of a song from Colonel Bagshot, like a 70s song that uh, is actually more memorably sampled in a song from DJ Shadow's second album, The Private Press, called uh, Six Days, which has Most Def on it, which is one of my favorite DJ Shadow songs and is actually a staple of my childhood. And this sample is used, I'm biased here because the sample is used in a much less interesting way on this song. And the song is like so bizarrely minimal that like, the sample really doesn't fit at all. It has this kind of like low key thing and just feels really clunky and just kind of poorly put together. Like the thing is like so many of these songs feel like demos. And when you have the budget of Pusha T and when you have like the, the vision of Kanye as, as like a person who really knows how to chop up interesting samples, the music should not sound like demos. It was the same fucking problem that Donda had, right? And it's really almost exacerbated here. I think the problem is even worse here at certain points than it was on Donda. Uh, I think the, the most egregious example of this, the most irritating song on the record for me is Call My Bluff, which thank, is just you. which is just so it's fucking unlistenable. Like terrible, really anodyne, dull sample beat, just absolutely and a, re- a dumb, really weak dumb, chorus dumb. too. Like 100 Call dumb, My dumb, Bluff. Dumb. It's so like push a sound is so bad it's just terrible like what the fuck is going on I don't here? Be anima, gotta call him my and, that's the song and and the worst the worst like production like mixing decision on the entire album i think or at least like the most egregious is in the song rock and roll and i don't understand why this is the case i don't understand what the the thinking is here because it's mm-hmm. clearly intentional but why does Kid Cudi sound like he's being recorded through like a fucking tip <laughs> pan? Like, why is his vocal part on the song? Why does it sound like literal dog shit? Why is it like this? And here's the thing, right? I, I've kind of been, we reviewed Kid Cudi last year and it was kind of like, that was one of his better records and we still spent most of that review kind of shitting on them because he's kind of, we don't really like Kid Cudi. Kid Cudi here and we risk alienating certain people by saying that I want to double down and say I find Kid Cudi fucking insufferable in general now especially when he's doing that thing that he does he sounds terrible here he's completely got no presence it's it's good rock and roll man he sounds so fucking tuneless and he does that at the best of times and when you combine that with this fucking production that makes him sound like he's fucking on him he's just like his voice is like loaded with static it's just like what what's the goal here what's what's the aim i'm so confused i'm so lost and it's again a shame because you have some pretty good bars here you i mean i 
maybe I'm overselling the bar quality to a certain extent. Like it's not going to change the game. It's not like, you know, S tier shit, but there's a lot of funny moments. Like there's some cool wordplay consistently. And I think that generally Kid Cudi accepted. Uh, Push does bring out the best in a lot of the collaborators on this record in terms of guest verses. Like generally speaking, they're really good. And I will echo comfortably the sentiment that uh the clips collab i pray for you as a highlight on this record um, oh that's the best song on here i think i i don't think it's the best song on here i think that's probably still brambleton just because it feels like the most finished track here and this song still has like it has a great sort of sound to it and a kind of epic swell to it and fantastic rapping but it still kind of just ends like really suddenly in a way that i don't like but still that aside the verses here from both push and clips i mean it feels like classic clips to me it it, it very ha- like from from push and malice i should say it has like it's so much more of a satisfying reunion for them than that fucking uh what's that song on jesus is king that was built oh, as like the clips reunion used this gospel and it was like the most like fucking stupid shit like, phoned in from malice like he didn't really want to be there and malice wanted to check <laughs> here malice is fucking hungry dude like there's just Mm. this energy to it he genuinely feels like he's back and wanting to do it i think what's emblematic of that is his decision to be billed as malice instead of no malice which of course is the moniker that he adopted when he converted like 10 years ago and and he said i'm never going to be malice again i'm no malice from now on which is just kind of fucking funny but it's cool here that he's come back and he's um you know he's just dropping a lot of really funny bars and stuff and look it's a great end to the record. It's really strong, but it's hard going getting there. And I just, yeah, there's other moments I enjoy. Like I think Nick and Rist is probably like rounds out the trio of best things on here alongside uh, Brambleton and I Pray For You. It's just one of the better produced songs. Uh, has like a, a pretty good hook and a pretty good presence from Pharrell and some there's a really funny like Game of Thrones bar on here from Pusha T where he calls himself the Night King and the Colgate Kilo the hood needs whitening uh which is really funny to me the B in the center of that left and white right wing the only time you'll ever see me next to Brightling he's just really funny he has these cool funny references oh and Jay-Z as well has a great feature on the song I I was pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed Jay-Z on this because he's kind of phoned it in a lot with his verses in this kind of later era of his career. Uh, but he has this, these really funny uh, lines where he talks about um, Saab stories, save your soliloquies, uh, the Khalifa brothers deep down, I believe you love us. Uh, there, there's these just, he's just got, and he has this energy to him that I really enjoy. And yeah, it, it's a good moment on the record. And um, yeah, and I'm it's kind a of- better st- versus jail. Uh, well, uh, oh, fucking yeah, for sure. Like. <laughs> I'm talking myself in circles here. Jake, we haven't really heard from you yet. I want to hear what your thoughts are, what you think of the highlights and lowlights of this thing. And and just, yeah, I feel like you're kind don't of on a similar page to me. Don't fucking hold your breath. I don't think I've ever been more thoroughly rendered redundant on this podcast than I have for this segment because lo and behold, I completely fucking agree with basically every fucking thing that you just said. I, If anything, I think I might like the album slightly less. I, I just... Like, yeah, I, I, and that's the thing too, is that like, I agree with the fact that like Push is consistently very good on this album as the thing that I think kills it for me is really just redundancy and subject matter. And that like, I know that Daytona wasn't exactly an album that was just like, you know, littered with all like, you know, it's a fucking seven track record and it's 20 minutes long. And in many ways, I'm starting to think that that's sort of the optimal length for Push as an artist and that this feels at 36 minutes bloated as fuck because in between the pretty stellar opener and closer i mean you were far more elegant about it but god this is straight mid it's like for the whole fucking album every single song is just like it's good it's just like what does Pusha T do? He raps about cocaine. What does the feature do? They come on and they do what they normally do, which in Kid Cudi's case is suck. And uncharacteristically, I kind of find Don Tolliver's feature a bit annoying on Scrape It Off the Top, which I just kind of think is a lesser cut on here. I just, well, I mean, lesser in terms of the fact that it's just like, there's just like, 
everything in the middle of this album, and I do mean the middle, ah, mm-hmm. ah, is that it's just like everything here is just like it's like push just really doubles down it's just like oh, i'm the cocaine cowboy and like look i really admire the fact that his flows are so tight i really like that push is you know on the older side of modern rappers right now and still manages to sound young and hungry on basically every single bar and like again oh, yeah. if you're a push fan this is probably gold for you but as somebody who's just you know a casual fan of his it's just like <laughs> It's Almost Dry is a terrible album name for many reasons, but it's also quite an apt name because it kind of implies the fact that it's just like, maybe you should have waited a little bit longer here. The The mastering issue coupled with the, the midness really is kind of the Achilles heel of the album for me because once you just, you're sitting here, it's like 35 minutes of this is just way too fucking long at some point. Like you're midway through, like in, you know, right diet coke for example which is a pretty decent song it's just like you know you're kind of into the thick of the record and then you just get rock and roll call my bluff and scrape it off the top and i'm just like i'm yawning and i still have to get through two other songs after that in order to get to the uh, other album standout it's just it's a matter of pacing in the sense that yeah this album isn't long but it's also just insanely repetitious a lot of those beats like let the smokers shine the coops would be cool if they were a part of a beat instead of just not the whole fucking thing and a lot of the beats just sound like that they're really bass heavy they're really minimal and push sounds good on them but it's just this is a quintessential example of the album format undoing mostly good music it's just that all of these songs individually are pretty decent at worst they're Eh. but once you throw them all together on one project it's like this just is not a project that has the tightness and concision of his other work for me and as much as I hate to admit it it's just an album that fundamentally has a lot of great things going for it it's just that everything about it every way this album is framed and is an album just kind of suffers and it's just kind of a shame for me really I guess and I feel bad because like well not bad but like it's a shame doubly because he's kind of built this as a more personal record and, and he's kind of like trying to move on from Coke rap, or at least he's, he claims to be. There's a lot of Coke rap on this record. It, it does like, a to be lot, fair, a little too much, a little too much. To be fair, it has kind of like that elder statesman Coke rap feel where he's kind of like, yeah, yeah. And, and sure, whatever. Uh, I enjoy it a little bit more than I en- I've enjoyed like Freddie, Freddie Gibbs Coke rap over the last few years, even though I think Freddie Gibbs is a better rapper overall. Uh, but it's just kind of like, I'm a bit, it's a bit played out. And so, yeah, and it's kind of a shame because I do sense a desire for him to kind of move forward a little bit, but it feels so non-committal. And yeah, and just to cap it, my biggest reservation is that when you're an artist this big, and this is not a throwaway record, like this is you're billing this as your next kind of big mm. record, you should not, it should not sound like demos. It should not sound so tossed off. Like even the best songs here, like Diet Coke, it doesn't feel finished. It just ends. Like these songs just kind of like happen and there's really very little sense mm-hmm. of structure to them. Like even within the conventions of rap, like you have decent hooks, you have decent verses, you have often decent beats, but they're just kind of jaggedly thrown together. And mm-hmm. even Daytona, I think, had more you know, substance and nuance in the way that these songs were constructed than this does. And I don't know. It's 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 a, it feels like wasted potential to a certain extent, even though I get that it is Push's vision. But yeah, it's emblematic of all the different things that I dislike about the way that Kanye makes music now. Not even talking about his rapping, just the way mm-hmm. that he makes music now. It just feels so cheap in a way that I think belittles the talents of those involved. I don't mean to demean it th- this much, but to me, it is an album that really does have all of the same problems as Donda, save for the length. It's just the the haphazard construction of it. It just feels very sloppy into the point where it's like you're so focused on the in the moment sort of how everything sounds and how like you know, just like the the in the moment listening that's a lot of important and a lot of like why Kanye and Push are still very relevant, vital, important artists and why they're still appealing to their fan bases respectively right now. But they're also in pursuit of this, they're completely disregarding all of the things that are going to make people like their projects down the road. I, I think that this is just sort of going to be seen in retrospect as a bit of a 
a minor effort on their parts, just sort of a, a, a product of an era where creative ambition is just so far off the mark that it just kind of leads to really talented people making really messy projects. Well, I enjoyed this album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm good glad for you, you, man. Oh no, I think oh, I think there is a lot of interesting stuff here. And again, I think maybe it's because I mean, I noticed a bit of like you know the again like some of the haphazards thrown together with this album, especially you know on track. Grape it off is a song I did not enjoy because I don't think Pusha T wears like trap very well. I mean, I think nah. Lil Uzi does do it well but like it's not on one of his own produced songs so it just kind of feels like everybody is just kind of scraped together if you will but honestly i think there is something here to it being more of a personal record even a song i didn't care for that much let the smokers shine the coops i don't know like i think there's really interesting stuff here at least to the lyrics and again maybe with a bit of polish it could have been one of the best songs on the record Especially like the lyric cocaine's Dr. Seuss. I was thinking to myself, oh wait, shit, does he think he's like, you know, this genius creative or is he selling crack to children? And I was like, so I think there is a lot of- There's a lot of double ex- meaning in, in the lines that, like, yeah. like that at this record, which is why he's so talented at, at, at writing. Yeah, so I think there is a lot of reflection on this record, especially the last track, which may as well be- the coffin on clips because it's like oh you have one you have one rapper who kind of made like uh because if you don't know clips basically ended because malice was part of a drug bust and that basically was kind of that led to the beginning of the end for for clips and there's something there to malice's verse about you know being very traumatized by the whole event and basically why he hung the coat up basically and wanted to, you know, base and basically had stopped working with Pusha as clips. And you have Pusha who's basically kind of doing this victory lap over these very apocalyptic organs and, you know, church choirs. And then you have Malice who's basically like, I get traumatized anytime I hear a coke and anytime I hear somebody sniffing. Yeah. Uh, which, Honestly, I thought was a really, really strong way to end the record. And is this like a great album? I don't think so. Again, I think there's a couple of tracks that just completely fall flat. I thought that honestly, overall, I was satisfied with this record and what we got. And funny story, uh, when I was listening to rock and roll, I was playing Super Mario Brothers. And then, of course, Pusha drops a Mario reference. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Um, this is a weird coincidence <laughs> yeah so one thing i thought that would be fun to do even though it's kind of silly but just it could be a way that i build this as well is i have written in the chat uh for this zoom call i've written i've written out which songs were produced by pharrell and which songs were produced by yay and i thought we could do a thing where we like we kind of yay versus pharrell who do we think <laughs> who do we think uh, gives the better production this is overall? So tough because immediately to me, Pharrell has the lowest moments and the highest moments, and Ye has the more consistent half. Yeah. And so this is well, tough. Yeah. All right, Jacob, uh, if you're ready, why don't you go first? Who do you think? Pharrell versus Ye, who won? Pharrell versus Ye, who won? Um, oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. I have to give it to Ye only because I think the beat for I Pray for You was honestly really excellent and i i just thought pharrell's like was kind of relying a little more on repetition uh and again like i thought the dreaming of the past sample was like uh, the the jealous guy sample that was used in dreaming of the past i thought was really well executed i think i guess uh point yay yay and jake yeah, let the smokers shine the coops on Pharrell's half is not doing him any favors. That, that said, I am actually going to go with Pharrell. Um, he just has my favorite songs on here, uh, save for I Pray For You, which y- Ye does have a lot of m- meritable beats on here. It's just that even on the good ones is that he still has problems with the good ones on me, like Dreaming With The Past has those like mixing errors that really just kind of fumbles the bag at the very end there for me so i'm gonna have to go with pharrell even though like i I still like some elements of some of his beats that on here that are admittedly lesser 
Okay, well, this is this makes it interesting because it's a tie game, so I have a deciding vote here. And I, again, have to fall on a lot of the same points that both of you have brought up. Uh, I agree with the sentiment that Pharrell has the higher highs and the lower lows. Kanye is more consistent overall, um, but also is responsible for a lot of the most, you know, irritating aspects of this record, uh, not only in terms of production, but in terms of like how, you know, mixing and mastering all that sort of thing, but the, the stuff that he has a, a much stronger role in. I know he doesn't actually master the records, but still his <laughs> vision for it, how these things should sound. And, oh, it's really tough because, yeah, the two worst beats on this album are Let the Smokers Shine the Coops and Call My Bluff. <laughs> and they're really bad. But then again, uh, I was going to go for L because like Brambleton is just so good. Yeah, I, I didn't mention Open Ear probably. either, but I lo really love the way that track sounds. Yeah. Neck and Wrist mm -hmm. has, a like, has a lovely sort of moderate sensibility to it i think scrape it off is musically one of the highlights of the back half but i think i'm gonna go with jacob and say yay it's just like i think dreaming of the past like again as much as the way that he mixes the vocals fucks me uh, it, it reminds me so much of what i love about kanye and what makes him so unique rock and roll i kind of have a similar opinion about where there's a lot that's memorable in the way that that beat is constructed and the sample usage and stuff i yeah, I um, yeah, I'm just gonna have to go with yay, but it's really tough. So, yay takes it in this battle. <laughs> For the so first time on this podcast, Kanye West wins. I'm gonna hold solidarity. Say I vote for Pharrell. So, favorite tracks and ratings then for Pusha T. It's almost dry. Jake, won't you go first? Favorite on here, definitely Brambleton and I Pray For You. I'm sure that's not exactly going to be a hot take. Uh, I'll also say Open Air is definitely a good moment of uh, production on here. And uh, least favorite is probably fucking, uh, probably Hear Me Clearly, because I can't. Kanye. <laughs> uh, and uh, fucking five out of ten. All right. Uh, my three favorite tracks are going to be Brambleton, I Pray For You, and Neck and Wrist. And I, my least favorite track on here is definitely Call My Bluff. And yeah, I actually, the second time I listened to this record, I, I properly fucking just hated it. And it's actually like I've warmed on it a little bit more. Weirdly enough, it was originally going to be a four, but I do think there's enough memorable here to say that it's not a bad record. It just, again, feels like ideas that could have been better executed and, and good music that's hobbled in ways that are frustratingly kind of stupid. So I'm going to go with a five as well. I'm going to agree with Jake on that. I guess my favorite tracks on here, my favorite is I Pray For You. Uh, second favorite would probably be Open Air. And then after that, I... I, I was going to go with Hear Me Clear, but I think I'm going to go with the Dreaming of the Past, if not for um, that wonderful line, rock star like Third Eye Blind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, honestly, like I wrote a big, weird, ass, not essay, but paragraph as to why I thought that was slightly or like extremely interesting. But um, I guess my least favorite would be uh, a Scrape It Off. And I don't know, I thought, Mixed bag overall, but I'm leaning more towards the positive side. 6.5 out of 10. I uh, I really wish he'd like picked a band that actually have a song called Rockstar. Like, this is a real <laughs> deep cut, but if he had said Jimmy Eat World and acknowledging that he has listened to um, their second album, which is called Static Prevails, which has a, a great song on it called Rockstar. If, if he had said uh, uh, Rockstar like Jimmy Eat World, I get that Third Eye Blind is also wordplay and for other reasons, but like if you'd said that, I would have probably bumped this by an entire point just for really selfish reasons. But yeah, okay, 6.5 from Jacob means that we have an average rating overall of 5.5 for Pusha T's. It's pretty dry. I, I hate <laughs> that I can so vividly hear in my head. It's just like, like Jimmy Eat World, I got clarity. <laughs> Rap so good it gives you a heart attack. I'm a rock star like Nickelback. Oh, oh no! I would, I would like my Nickelback, the, the nickel that I gave you for streaming this album. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wolf. Anyway, let's move on to our second review of the day, which is of course. The new album from King Gizzard, 
and the Lizard Wizard Omnium Gatherum. You know, I thought we would never review this band again. <laughs> I was pretty <laughs> confident. Not because, like, we thought they were done necessarily, although I think we were kind of fatigued with their endless middling releases, but also just kind of like, it felt like after we reviewed KG and LW, that kind of, what else would we have to say about King Gizzard? Like, they're so omnipresent in music culture, and they're so, like, releasing music constantly. It's like, well, I mean, what's the point? But... To their credit, here we are talking about King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard in a full segment. And right off the bat, I will say, this is my favorite King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard album. Oh. I don't know if that's probably, it's probably not a surprise if you know me that well, because you know I don't love this band. And I, I think they're kind of the perennial seven out of 10 band for me. And I mean, spoiler alert, this album is no exception. But here it's like, a, a really like it's a seven out of ten by design like it's a messy fucking album it's all over the shop it does a lot of different things and i never stop enjoying it it is an absolute blast for 80 minutes and when you consider that kglw those two records were were like a single double album that was split in half like an 80 minute record that was split in half and when you consider the quality of that compared to the 80 minutes of material you have here like it's night and day. Come on. This is, for me, like the most I've enjoyed a King Gizzard project from front to back. Uh, it has their best ever song on it. No points for guessing yes. which one it is. And oh. it's just a the fucking... It's... Anyway, I'll save my thoughts you guys are probably much more King Gizzard, bigger King Gizzard fans than me, so you can give better context to your thoughts anyway. Jake, you're rubbing your hands together, so why don't you go off? What is Omnium Gatherum? What were your expectations, and how does this record land for you? Well, I can't say that I was in a different place than Riley was in the fact that the last couple King Giz albums just didn't hit for me. Like, I didn't even really think any of them were bad, but when you go with KG was good but something they'd done before and lw was less good and something they'd done before and then butterfly 3000 just kind of struck me as a very slight release a very non-committal to the sounds that they were you know that's the appeal of king giz at the end of the day is that they are the best kind of journeyman band working today is that they clearly are people who just fucking love all kinds of music when it comes to acid rock, garage rock, psychedelic rock, fucking synth pop, fucking microtonal, whatever the fuck, prog mm -hmm. rock, anything you can name, they've attempted to do it at some point. I probably listed two genres there and Riley's about to make fun of me, but. No, you're, the... <laughs> you're on point. <laughs> okay. I agree. But, but the thing is, is not that they are this eclectic band, that they do all of these different things. It's that they do them well. My favorite releases from this band are the ones where I think that they have committed the most and that they've kind of, their natural inclinations of musicians have sort of lined up with their ambition the most. Albums like, uh, uh, I was about to say, Embrace the Rat's Nest. Good job. Uh, infest the rat's nest. Don't embrace it. Uh, infest the rat's nest and uh, albums like uh, Nonagon Infinity, uh, albums that just really take what they normally do and just kind of rev it up a little bit more. And I was just worried that I would never sort of get this phase of the band where they sort of blend what they naturally do, which is, you know, garagey, acid rocky shit and some sort of new cool genre bent that they're experimenting with. And they, ex you know, exude this kind of confidence and joy that just kind of, you don't find a lot with bands today. And the thing is, is that I was just sort of worried that, you know, we never, get another incarnation of them that sort of does something as crazy as them releasing five albums in one year that are all different and all good. And the cool thing about Omnium Gatherum is not only does it feel like a proper, you know, it's the 20th album from this band and it 
feels like the 20th album from this band and that they are treading old ground that they've done before but in terms of like they're kind of recontextualizing it there are songs on here that feel straight off of uh shit like um uh infest the rat's nest there's songs like gaia that are just fucking brashy ragers and they're just a blast they're saying they sound more vital and more immediate than anything they've made since that album frankly and then they're doing songs like the dripping tap which are like i don't even know where to begin with this fucking song yeah it's the best song on here i think it's the best song they've ever made it's a fucking 18 minute long opus and it's probably going to uncontestedly be the best album opener that comes out this year because if it was an ep it would be the best ep of the year it's just a song that manages to encapsulate every reason why this band is so fucking awesome and why I love this band and that they're doing something kind of new and weird but also something old and cool and they don't stop there they fucking go they make two hip-hop songs on this album they have songs like Sadie Sorceress and Grim Reaper which have been kind of contentious and what I've seen people like receive them and sorry but as a fan of OG Beastie Boys albums this shit slaps like a motherfucker. They like, are these songs lyrically like amazing or any? No, but they're fun. The important thing is that this album is so much fucking fun for its sustained 80 minute runtime. And man, that like opening run of shit, like the dripping tap through evilest man on here. One of the best runs of music this band has ever made, frankly. I love the kind of details that are on songs like Magenta Mountain, the sort of piano like glissandos that are on like the edge of some of the mix here is just, mwah, it's beautiful. They were and- writing great melodies again. Like this is the thing I always tune out from <laughs> yes. when their songs are like very proficiently technically great, but just monotonous sounding. Whereas like, as soon as Magenta Mountain comes in, that shit's just beautiful and memorable and the melody is gorgeous. That's it's just fucking so good. Beautiful melodies. And honestly, same thing with Kepler 22B and then Gaia just absolutely steamrolls you. And then even something like Amber Grease comes along and it's just this opening run here stays to the core of this sort of like sound and even lyrically this is an album that very much encompasses all of their interests their environmental interests they're sort of like there's really topical songs on here like the evilest man which just frankly slap like a motherfucker uh and yeah. then they're you know they're sort of weirder more out there moments like sadie sorceress and they've got the sadie sorceress which is just so so infinitely catchy and i just love it And the end stretch here too, like Grim Reaper, Predator X, Red Smoke and the and Candles. That's an amazing late album highlight. And I really like the album Closer to Funeral too. And basically what I'm trying to get at here is that this is an album that makes me feel happy and reminds me of why I love this band. It reminds a bunch of people why they love this band and it's great. And I so desperately desperately wished that i loved the middle stretch as much as i do the first and final third of it i won't like i I, this is the best album they've made in a good goddamn while i love it i even love the lesser moments on here but i really can't deny that it does have a tiny bit of a slump the garden goblin blame it on the weather persistence and frankly oh, the I, kind I of lackluster pres- mm-hmm. persistence is okay presumptuous on the other hand i think is kind of a lackluster cut frankly there's just moments on here where the energy in the middle and the vitality of the first and final third just lose their way a little bit it did grow on me i was at first just kind of like i don't really think that like it, it's a bit of a non-starter for me but they are good songs I just wish that they were executed with the bravura that the rest of it is. That said, it's a very small segment of the album when you consider like the amount of time that is eclipsed. Like a lot of these songs are on the shorter side. So when I say that it's the middle third, what I really mean is there's about 20% of this album that I think is a bit less on the great side. But the 80 to 85% here 
oh, it's some of the best shit the band's ever made. And it makes me feel confident knowing that this band can still do something like this, that I'm going to be following what they're doing for the next five years, which is not something I would have said like 12 months ago. So I do love this album. It's just in this sort of, it, it epitomizes why they're great. And it sort of epitomizes some of the more like less essential moments that they've been dabbling in semi recently for me but undeniably I think that's kind of part of the grand design of what this whole 20th album grand statement kind of is and I kind of bizarrely love that about it even if it does kind of drag a little bit it's just part and parcel with the King Gizzard experience this is like a an almost a greatest hits in the sense that it's a greatest hits of why you love this band when it comes to my personal experience with this band, I don't have much compared to y'all. Like I've heard Nana Gun Infinity, which I which I enjoy, uh, Fly Microtonal Banana, which I think is just okay, except for Rattlesnake, which is a masterpiece, and then um, Infest the Rat's Nest, which I adore. It's like if Black Sabbath made a thrash album, so like that's up my alley. And I don't know, like I always found this band's discography to be like just like a daunting which i'm sure is a common not <laughs> criticism but just like right. they have you know 20 albums and they they were on their like eighth year as a band or ninth or what like uh but they haven't been around for you know a very long time so when i went into this album i didn't know what to expect all i know is that i loved the uh the opening track and which was the first single the dripping tap which i was like holy shit this is like if we're going to get shit like this all throughout the album, I'm I'm in. I remember when, when that dropped and like, and they did announce the album that it was going to be 18 tracks and people were like, wait, is this going to be like a six hour album? And like every song <laughs> is going to be like that. I was like, no way. <laughs> but there was part of me that was like, no, they might, they might fucking but do But they it. would. Yeah. They would. I, I expect them to make their Daughter of Darkness very soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Please, honestly. Uh, do uh, fucking King Gizzard NTS sessions win. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um oh good. Okay, but then but then like uh because I remember I was listening to Magenta Mountain on a radio show and I was just like, this is King Gizzard? Like this is like because mm-hmm. I didn't listen to Butterfly 3000, which is their supposed synth pop album. I didn't really know that they had branched out like so delicately because this this song what i'll say about this album uh is that it has some of my absolute favorite drumming of the year uh there are just like so many fills and just little bits of like tiny zest and i was like uh we're on a track like magenta mountain which could just be like you know a throwaway alt rock song like these drums and like the little melody at the beginning which which keeps coming back which sounds like a john carpenter track it reminded me just... of um mgmt weirdly of all things yeah, yeah. totally if i have to shout out a favorite a uh, couple of favorite tracks on here my favorite and it's maybe my favorite king gizzard song is evilest man which yeah. i thought was like because what i uh the, the the parts that really got me on this record were um the hard rock tracks and the songs that sounded more like 60s pop where Mm -hmm. and evilest man is basically both like you have Mm -hmm. like this this beatles or zombie-esque melody in the vocals and then it just like shreds with this acid rock jam where i was just like Mm -hmm. holy shit this is absolutely everything i could want out of like a band like this that's doing that sort of retro rock style and um I had, I love the Garden Goblin. It's about his dog and how he chomps up bits at his garden. And I thought it was cute. <laughs> this is I, totally the, this is King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard's White Album. I actually yes, I think this like, is low key a little bit better than that album because its low points aren't as bad as the White Album's low points. But still, it's the same principle. Like yeah, it's like that sort of like kind of beautiful mess like i was reminded a lot of king master george which is Fishman's second album which again is also yeah. very throwing shit at the wall see what sticks uh that also experiments with kraut rock and trip hop and even like harder harder sort of elements which speaking of the hip-hop tracks oh boy uh okay 
I, I am having a big war in my brain because the snobby critic side of me wants to dismiss these as like, because even though I love the instrumentals on this, I love the drums. Like they sound like really like classic and uh, absolutely wonderful. I was like thinking to myself, especially with the vocal delivery, are, is this what would happen if Beastie Boys solely listened to the rap in Roll the Bones by Rush? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 reason, the reason I love the rapping in, in these two songs is precisely because it is so unfashionable in terms of what style of rapping it is. Not even just yeah. like weird for this band, but like this is 90s rap through and through. It has the cadence, it has the sound, it has the flow, the beats are very 90s, the drum breaks, especially on Sadie Sorceress, which is honestly one of my favorite things yeah. on this entire album. And so those good. drum breaks. It, it has like the super like uh anachronistic feel and it's so like tasteless in terms of like what's you know hip right now that i have this really begrudging respect for it and also i just genuinely really think it goes and then, yeah. then like the other part of me is like they're they sound like they're having the time of their life on this album oh like, these uh, or, like a... are going to be amazing live and by the oh, way wow. if you haven't heard king gizzard's live albums do that immediately. They are easily some of the best things this band has ever produced. Yeah, I uh, I would absolutely I need to do that. But like that's like the hip hop tracks. Eventually, I was kind of won over by them because I'm like, yeah, they do sound like they're having a lot of fun and it, and they're produced extremely well. And I like that sort of like classic instrumentation that's on there. Like honestly, it reminds me more of the Beastie Boys in terms of instrumentation more than anything yeah um and then um i on my notes i wrote persistence as the best flight of the concord song that's not by flight of the concords i love that <laughs> persistence <laughs> the fucking chorus hook of this song has been stuck in my head all week and i am not mad about it it's catchy as fuck and i love it legitimately a highlight it was no yeah I, I i thought that song was adorable i i i enjoyed that one because like it's literally like a funny track about having sex and comparing yourself to a car Ooh, it's yeah, just... yeah. persistence <laughs> like a bold medial piston it, it's so <laughs> it's just like my thing but yeah fly to the concords fuck i'm mad i didn't think of that it's a great comparison for that <laughs> Uh, I mean, I I had a big flight of Concords phase in college. So like anytime I heard those acoustic guitars on this delivery, I'm like, oh, it's the most beautiful girl in the room. <laughs> I guess like I, there isn't a lot negative to say about this record, but I will say that I think that the first half is me definitely better than the uh, around presumptuous. I start to get a little weary like because I, I didn't like presumptuous that much and predator x like, actually like predator x quite a bit but um i think the album's closing tracks even though again i admire what they're doing i just don't really vibe with them as much as the best moments on on the rest of the record but i was excited and i was like thinking of oh shit where is this gonna go like i was with the white album or king master george or tusk or any sort of like album that's like okay fuck it we're just we'll do everything we will do absolutely everything and the fact that this is their 20th album and the fact that they're still experimenting i i'm i'm excited for the next phase of king gizzard and i will finally i think i may actually try to finally do a deep dive on their discography because i think that honestly this does it's like a really fun band to just really immerse yourself into yeah king gizzard are uh, it's it's been a really tough relationship with them and i've kind of like started hating myself for my inability to really get fully on board with a lot of their records like it's felt like every time i've said i'm going to put on this really beloved album of theirs and it's going to be the it's going to be the moment like it's happened with infest the rat's nest most recently with polygon dwana land not a gone infinity and look they're all really good records, but there's just something about, I just don't fully click. And it just, it, it's really, really frustrating. I would say before this, the best ones for me have, were in, in Your Mind Fuzz and Flying Microtonal Banana. But even they were like, had a particular ceiling. And one of my issues with 
a lot of the biggest King Gizzard records is that while they're great, they can be so unified in sound and it can be a, like a kind of style of a garage rock that and a production style that I just don't fully engage with that, you know, it, it just there's little to really grab onto when all the songs are in that mode. Whereas with Omnium Gatherum, they're veering all over the place and it's like just the right level of just, you know, all these different things that they can do and everything is just tempered perfectly and, and, and the song construction feels stronger to me, the melodies and the hooks feel better to me, the production overall feels more inviting to me and I'm just never really distanced from this record at all. It's an incredibly quick listen. I just absolutely adore this thing. Like I love, I think, you know, Dripping Tap, as I said, is, is their best song. And yet a lot of the times when I listen to this record, I'll just like start at the second track just to like listen to, like to really focus in on the rest of it because like I have heard the first song so much now. Yeah, I, I, I share a lot of the highs that have been talked about and I've kind of talked about my feelings already. I will say on the note of the rapping tracks here, I want to shout out the Grim Reaper as well. One of the things I love about this, this is a very like me reference point but the rapping here specifically sounds like the kind of rapping you would get on like a, a hip house or a big beat sort of like late 90s record specifically i thought of fat boy slim with the grim reaper mm. it felt like the kind of like rap feature that we would kind of have on one of those songs that is like heavily influenced by instrumental hip-hop but is much more about dance and house music from the late 90s that's music that i grew up on music that i cut my teeth on so i was already on board i was that shit was made for me it was a really pleasant surprise when those moments came along evilest man i think as i share the sentiment that's a big highlight on this record uh did away with me with see i just want to shout out the fact that the sort of synthy passages in the midsection of the song reminded me so much of like craft work and like trans europe mm. express era craft work totally. and these like lush kind of gorgeous uh sounds and and that was a huge surprise for me I absolutely adore that. Uh, Kepler 22B, I think, is just a, a perfect King Gizzard, like, rage, not rager, but, like, it, it has that kind of pop sensibility to it, and it's really funky yeah. and fun. Uh, Guy is a rager. Uh, I do oh, think Guy that, is absolutely a rager. I do think that this mm -hmm. Gaia and Predator X re represent this kind of style of King Gizzard that I connect to the least in general, which is more to do with, like, the vocals, where they have this kind of mon mon monotonous kind of, like, continuous sound to them that i kind of don't love but gaia gets away with it because there's just some sick guitar shit happening the riffs are great the solo at the end of the song is just absolutely fucking awesome so i get it gets away with it uh, for that reason even though i don't care for the, the, the that general sound they dabble into it's probably why i was never really able to fully connect with rat's nest that said though uh minor moments in this record even the low lights which i probably agree with jake on songs like garden goblin and blame it on the weather i still think these are good songs they have like memorable hooks they have they're catchy they're pleasant i, I really enjoy them presumptuous is kind of like a, a guilty pleasure for me i kind of really like that song uh weirdly enough um and yeah and it just ends really really strongly as well it's just a an, an adorable record a, a really endearing album and I, it makes me feel more connected to this band than i ever have before i wouldn't be surprised if my overall ratings and impressions of this continue to grow uh the more time i get to spend with it the more i get to get used to its intentional bagginess and its disheveledness i mean i think the the thing to take away from this this is something i think they emphasized in the lead up to this as well and like the press notes is like how energized and excited to be a band they were like doing this how like freshly um, you know, the new kind of fresh energy and, and enthusiasm they had for making music when they kind of really dug in and record, recorded these songs. And I think it really shows. And even though it's an 80 minute thing that's all over the place, I think maybe if you're anything like me uh, and you're still waiting for King Gizzard to really click, this might even be the record that does it. It's just so much to love here, so much that appeals to very distinct personal things that I enjoy and nostalgia that I have for particular eras of music. Uh, I think the dripping tap is evidence that we, if they do decide to do a full-on prog record, I'd be there like day one. I want, I want their like forty-minute three-song album. That's what I want. Oh my god! I want that them to make a yes album. Yeah, I was gonna say like I want them to do a close to the edge sort of thing, and I'll be there day one. But um, yeah, dripping tap proves they can nail it. It's a great record. I am fully on board, and and yeah, point. 
point in their corner for proving us wrong. Uh, we, we've been shitting on them a lot. Uh, and when we've talked about them in the past, just in terms of like being washed up, but here they are proving us wrong. So there we go. Very, very happy to be proven wrong with this basically monument to their creativity. It's like they literally took all of our concerns into question. We're like, okay, how can we, how can we finally win back over the Jams and Tea podcast? And then they just decided to do it. And you know, yeah. For is I, I do have my my couple issues with this album, but the more I listen to it, the more I kind of get on board with the fact that it's kind of a the the center of its kind of a transitional moment from its more substantial first part to its more substantial third part. So you know it could be an issue like the White Album where you just kind of learn to love those more minor like bridges in between the the songs. So I, I like don't be surprised if I end up liking this album even more than I already do because frankly it is an album that just kind of gets better. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of like the, you know a uh, great five track EP in this album takes here and I just want to be like mm. yep and like yeah. like yeah. we got a, an out we got more than that and it's great. So your point being like any great album could also be a great five track EP. You realize that, right? Yes. And there's at least two five track EPs worthy of good shit on here. Thank well, you very the much. Thing is, like the appeal is like, it's this big shaggy throw it at the wall double album. Like there's, there's, I have a grudging and great respect for bands who do this, who do this thing, who make this effort, even when it doesn't land for me, even when I think that it's mixed and I don't, I think it's too long, all that sort of stuff. I have a respect for when they do this kind of thing, but when bands really Absolutely. make this kind of record, I think it's an undervalued type of album. And I think more, it should be more respected uh, even when it doesn't all work. And it does work here, but like sometimes it doesn't all work, but I still think it should be encouraged because it, yes, it, it's the kind of spirit of, of love for making music and of passion and of creativity and of trying new shit out that, you know, it, it should be encouraged and it represents a lot of mm. what I think is maybe downplayed and in, in a lot of modern music criticism. So yeah, there we are. Yeah, I totally agree. And honestly, King Gizzard be like going on for this long and still proving that they have fire in their belly is an absolute triumph. And yeah, fucking... I mean, you'll never, you'll never, it's, yeah. they seem to me like, and totally like impenetrable like they can never be kept like they'll never have a flop era that doesn't you know like immediately like they don't bounce back from in some way they they you can't keep this you can't keep this uh lizard down that's not that doesn't work <laughs> um <laughs> they do it for the love yeah all right favorite tracks and ratings then for uh omnium gatherer uh jacob why don't you go first this time um, my favorite tracks here, uh, my favorite's Evilest Man, uh, one of my favorite songs of the year uh, so far. Uh, and then I'm going to say The Dripping Tap and then Magenta Mountain. And I am going to give this, and my least favorite track as well would be, yeah, Presumptuous. And then um, my, my score would be an 8 out of 10. All right. Um, my few favorite tracks are Dripping Tap, uh, Magenta Mountain and Evilest Man. Um, maybe obvious picks, but hey, they're just like three of the best songs I've ever heard from this band. Uh, my least favorite is Predator X, just because it feels a little redundant with Gaia. Uh, I feel like that doesn't need to be on the record because of Gaia, but it's still a good song. Uh, and I'm going to give this a 7.5, and I would not be surprised if it bumps itself up to an 8 with enough time. I am going to say, yeah, favorite song here is definitely The Dripping Tap. Second favorite, uh, I'm spoiled for choice. I'm going to say, yeah, Magenta Mountain's been a song that's really grown on me. And I'm also going to say Evilest Man. Yeah, uh, least favorite song is probably Presumptuous. And uh, I'm going to give it a, a really, really strong 8 out of 10. Hell yeah, let's go. Yeah. That means that Omnium Gatherum gets a 7.8 average from the Jams and Tea podcast. Let us know at home what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today. Pusha T's is almost dry and King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizards Omnium Gideon. Do you agree with our takes? Do you disagree with our takes? Do you have a different perspective? If you do, or even if you just agree, we want to hear from you in the comments below. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, head on over to the YouTube link in the description of this podcast. Leave us a comment there. Let us know what you think of 
the albums and let us know what you think of the podcast as well. If you enjoy what we do, please consider giving us a five-star rate and review on Apple or Spotify. And if you have not already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel too on YouTube. Both of those things are tiny and I know all creators ask the audiences to do it, but they genuinely help us an awful lot. If you want to go above and beyond and support the channel, you can hit the join button on our YouTube page. And for just $1 a month, you can support us directly. Be one of our besties. Get your name featured in the title call of every video on this channel. Priority comment response. And if you want to give us a recommendation of something to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Ford Motors, built Ford tough.